this is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 27, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 11. Relationships with God and Others. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Today we want to continue our series in the uh, general letters, actually uh, bring to a close our uh, series in the general letters by talking about 1 John. Now, um, you may recall that when we um, began this series, um, we looked at... Um, three letters addressed to um, Jewish Christians, James, Jude, and Hebrews. Then we moved to the general letters that discussed uh, and written to uh, a mixed audience of both Jew and Gentile. Uh, we looked at 1 Peter. We looked at 2 Peter. We've looked at um, uh, Third John. Second John, and now we're wrapping up with First John. So what we want to do is uh, uh, address um, First John, and um, First John is a letter uh, that um, is concerned about relationships. Um, it concerns about relationships with God, and concerned about relationships with others. Um, it. Um, it gives uh, information as to um, um, how we, we know we have a relationship with God uh, based upon how it is that we relate with one another. Um, so uh, this truly is a, a letter that focuses on um, our relationship with God manifests itself or evidences itself based upon our relationship with others. Um, we have an inability to love others, then, we're gonna, then we really don't have a relationship with God. Uh, if we say we have a relationship with God and have an inability to love others, um, that's a problem. Uh, James does not, or excuse me, John does not differentiate one's love for God from love from others. They are um, to be practiced by both. And so uh, we're gonna focus on relationship uh, in this uh, opening video, relationship of God with others, and um, and with others, and we're going to look at John one one through uh, two, I believe, thirteen. So as we begin uh, the first four verses of John, this first John, um, these first four verses is uh, one sentence. It's an extremely long sentence in, in the Greek. Uh, now, the English, our English Bibles will break it up, but it is, uh, it is a pretty long um, sentence uh, in the uh, Greek text. And so what we have is, uh, uh, in this opening uh, uh, four verses, um, John gives us uh, the intent of eyewitnesses the intent of eyewitnesses proclaiming and writing the message about the person, words, and works of Jesus. That's pretty much the subject. The, the author, John, is intent, uh, giving the intention or the intent of uh, eyewitnesses' proclamation. With this um, result, believers might have a relationship with one another as well as with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <coughs> so let's begin. We'll read all four verses, and we'll come back, and then we'll look at, um, look at the group of verses, um, verse by verse. This is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. And the life was revealed, and we have seen and testified and announced to you the eternal life that was with the Father 
and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you as well, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus, who is the Christ. Thus, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So here we have a letter uh, written by John, or at least it's classified or uh, considered one of the general letters. Uh, but unlike a typical letter, it has no opening salutation. It has a prologue. And um, it's one of those perplexing issues that um, uh, perhaps it's been mis, uh, mislabeled, misgrouped. Uh, regardless of how we might try to resolve uh, this, the issue of to be or not to be a letter, um, uh, we don't want to lose sight of this uh, tremendous prologue, which really is focusing on um, uh, the need to understand uh, our relationship with God. Um, this is what we, that is, uh, 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 is this uh, the question that... Um, that comes to mind is, is, is there more than one person um, writing this uh, letter? Um, um, or is this some type of uh, editorial we um, to represent um, John personally? Um, oftentimes, even when we talk, um, what we mean to say and I'm just talking about myself, me, myself, and I, we could put it that way. So, uh, but, you know, uh, so this is more of an editorial we. Uh, this is what I proclaim to you. I mean, could have easily um, been um, inserted there. But it's, it's not unusual to use a plural, uh, first person plural for oneself in writing. Uh, he says, what was from the beginning, um, the beginning could have a number of uh, references. It could be the beginning of all things, uh, like we see in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, it could be the beginning of creation that we see in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, I happen to think that this is more of a reference to um, the beginning of the Christian gospel, uh, which began with Jesus. Uh, so what was from the beginning of the, of the gospel message, which began with Jesus? Um, and, and I think some of this is somewhat supported because of the, uh, the next group of um, clauses. What we have heard. Okay, what, what, what did you, John, what did you hear? Uh, what we have seen with our eyes. John, what have you seen with your eyes? What we have looked at and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. Oh, must be Jesus. What, what we have heard from Jesus what we have seen with our eyes about Jesus, uh, what our hands have touched uh, concerning Jesus. Um, uh, this is, what, this is what, um, uh, what was from the beginning. This is the uh, proclaiming this message about Jesus and what he, what he was about. Um, and so he, he puts in here concerning the word of life, and of course I, th I think that kind of picks up on his gospel of uh, Jesus being the word of life coming from the Gospel of John. There are parallels um, between 1 John and the Gospel of John. And, and then in verse 2, it talks about how the life was revealed, and we have seen and testified and announced to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. So this is all the beginning uh, that he is proclaiming. What he's proclaiming has been from the beginning, from the beginning of Jesus' life, his ministry. And um, uh, he, is, he is confirming that what they have heard is true because it's what the eyewitnesses have revealed. And so he says in verse, thing, verse 3, what you have seen and heard we announce to you too. With this result, you may have fellowship with us. Um, this idea of uh, fellowship is from the, uh, a word known as uh, koinonia. Um, uh, on the one hand, koinonia can describe relationships in a concrete manner. 
uh, whether it be a marriage contract from, uh, uh, that they would kind of use during the reign of uh, Caesar Augustus. Uh, it could be a, um, uh, a desire to reproduce or a partnership. Um, on the other hand, uh, koinonia can describe relationships in an abstract sense, such as between a body and a soul, uh, between people and the created order, or people and other people. Here in 1 John 3, when uh, the author is talking about having fellowship or having a partnership with one another, the emphasis is uh, the mutual action between the author, John, and his readers, which involves uh, a mutual relationship with the Godhead as well. One commentator uh, puts it this way, the author of 1 John leaves no doubt of his conviction that the fellowship of believers found by Christ must result in the undivided unity of the Christian community. In turn, it is in fact that no Christian fellowship is imaginable unless it is founded on participation in the Christ event to which one John witnesses. Thus, those, so those who share in the life of God are brought into a relationship with one another, uh, which then becomes the basis and obligation of mutual love for one another. This is very foundational for where this letter is going. Um, it is about this mutual relationship that exists within the body of Christ, within the church, that has its foundation and its very basis on the gospel message about Jesus, the person of Jesus. So uh, what John has seen, <coughs> what John has heard, he announces to this readers, to his readers, so that they may have a partnership, a, a, a joining together, um, with them and with one another, as well as with the Godhead. Thus, we are writing these things that our joy may be complete. Um, once again, it's, this is uh, an editorial uh, we and um, uh, um, However, we do have this problem with so that our joy may be complete. Um, perhaps this may be at this point a reference to apostles as well. Um, but I think we're going to have to uh, forego that and move on because right off the top of my head I can't remember uh, what the what position I took when I went through and did this uh, a while back so uh, but we'll come back to that the next time we meet I'll come back to this verse and I'll have an answer for you uh, but right now there's um, fog in the pulpit uh, and so I'm just going to move on uh, I want to move on to um, uh, uh, verse 5 um, at this point where John uh, focuses on God who is perfect in love uh, and um, knows the difference between the self-righteous, those who claim to be believers, and a true believer who has a relationship with God, forgiveness, and an advocate before God. Now here he's, um, he's focusing attention on uh, God and, and how he knows the difference between self-righteousness and a true believer. Um, verse 5, um, God is, um, in his very being, is described as being perfect. Listen to what we have. Now this is the gospel message we have heard from him and announce to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now there is a um, there is the focus on the gospel message that has been heard and proclaimed. And this is that God is light. Now the question is, how are we to understand the word light here? Um, are we talking about 
uh, morality, that God is morally perfect? Or is light a reference to um, love? Um, I happen to follow um, Raymond Brown on this. Uh, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, light, uh, uh, he makes a difference between light and darkness later on in the, in the letter. Uh, and darkness is hatred, and light is love. And so I think what he's, what he's focusing on here on is not necessarily the moral purity of, of God, but the fact that God is a God of love. So the gospel message heard and proclaimed is that God is a God of love. And then the gospel message and heard is that there is no darkness, there is no hatred in God. First, uh, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness. There is no hatred. Uh, and so uh, we have this uh, presentation of God as being very perfect in, in being a person uh, of love. And then John points out that there are two types of people that exist. Those who are self-righteous and self-promoting believers and those whose lifestyle demonstrates they have a relationship with God, forgives, and has an advocate before God. Uh, verses 1 through 6, I mean, verse 1, 6 through 2, 2, um, he has these dis de dis depictions of two types, two groups of people. And we're going to look at these uh, groups, these two groups of people, and how they um, are distinguished in 1 John. First, John believes some people merely claim to have a relationship with God while others actually live a life that demonstrates they have a relationship with God. Listen to what we have in verses 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet keep walking in the darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we, John begins in verse 6, and he considers um, uh, people, uh, he considers that some people merely claim to have a relationship with God while living in darkness, um, living without love for others. Um, he points out it's likely that there are people who say, I have a relationship with God, and yet they make it a habit to live in hatred, to make it a habit to, to live in darkness, to have no regard for uh, another brother or hates another brother. Um, if we say we have fellowship with him and, and then hate others, um, we're lying. Um, and we're not practicing the truth. But if we walk in love, if we walk in light, um, he considers... Um, uh, um, people who make it a habit to live in love um, to have a relationship with God. Uh, he points out it's likely that there are people who make it a habit to live in love, live a life of love, to, to, um, um, to value relationships and take into consideration how can I live at peace and and demonstrate my love for an individual by the way in which I treat them, by the way in which I maybe even avoid them to prevent um, difficulties or uh, problems within community. Consider people who make it a live in life, uh, a life of love like God, have a fellowship with God because God is love. Um, so John considers it a people who make it a habit to live a life of love like God are free from the guilt of sin. Um, this idea of uh, fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that we're going to have, we, we're going to be sinless, and we're going to come back to this um, later on. Um, but part of obeying God in, in John is loving God and loving others. Uh, which is the basis uh, of the two commandments Jesus said were most important. 
loving God and loving others. And if you do that, then we, you avoid um, a life of, of sin. If you make it a pattern of, of belief, a pattern of, of life, um, that covers a multitude of sin. Then he moves on to uh, talking about um, um, a, another claim. This is a little bit more serious uh, because the, the results are a little worse. Um, listen to what he says in verses 8 to 9. Um, because John is talking about some people who merely claim to not sin while others confess their sin, which results in forgiveness. Verses 8 to 9. If we say we do not bear the guilt of sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Um, now, the Net Bible puts guilt of sin when really uh, the more literal rendering is we do not have sin. Um, and this is an expression that is limited to, um, to John. Uh, but it, the idea is um, in 1 John 8, the sense is uh, that the author is addressing people who have sinned warning them that they cannot claim to be free from the guilt of sin. The context of 1 John does not imply libertarianism on the part of the opponents, um, since the author makes no explicit charge of immoral behavior against opponents. The worst the author explicitly says is that they have failed to love brethren. It seems more likely that the opponents were saying that a believer did not ease uh, did after conversion were not sufficient enough uh, to be sins that could challenge one's intimate relationship with God. A relationship the author denies that the opponents have to begin with. So in other words, the, uh, it seems more likely that the opponents were saying that things a believer did after conversion weren't important. Um, once I've accepted Jesus, we, we have the freedom in Jesus to do whatever we want. And if we sin in the process, it doesn't matter because we belong to Jesus. And, um, and so if we say we don't bear any guilt of any subsequent sin after confessing Jesus as our Savior, uh, then we're deceiving ourselves. Paul says in Romans 8, when he talks about the grace of God and how it is when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, we, uh, we have, uh, we're free. Uh, we, we are no longer slaves to sin. And then he raises the question, but does that mean we should sin all the more? At which point he says, Meganoita, may it never be. Um, here it's the, same, it's the same idea. Once I'm saved uh, and I've had this conversion experience, does that mean then I can just continue on sinning, that it doesn't matter? And what the John, and John is attacking that by saying, if we say we don't bear any guilt of subsequent sin, we're fooling ourselves, we're lying. Um, and then he moves into the contrast. Okay, So if you have this, this belief that I can just sin and do whatever I want after Jesus, uh, after making a profession of faith, then we, we have sin in our lives. And that blocks a relationship with God. In contrast to that, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So um, if you have the mindset, I don't have to ask for forgiveness because I've done it once, then your relationship with God has been put on hold. Um, you have no relationship with God. Um, uh, we need to confess those sins and then be forgiven of those things, those sins. Um, and it's interesting, and we've already talked about this once before, um, uh, forgiveness isn't granted by God unless you ask for it, unless you confess it. Um, uh, the author of John here is not saying, oh, I've confessed, I mean, I'm, I, I've made a profession of faith and you know what? 
God, you just need to forgive me because that's just the thing you do. There, there are some Christians in some circles that don't feel you need to ask for forgiveness, that the Christian is just obligated to forgive with no repentance, with no confession, confession with no uh, uh, request for forgiveness. It doesn't work with God. It doesn't work with us. Um, there is this necessity to... Uh, to ask for forgiveness, to confess our sins uh, before God so that relationships can be restored. Um, so, uh, so John is concerned with, um, um, with two um, groups of people. One group who claims to have a relationship with God while living in darkness, and I've defined darkness as living in a, a life where uh, they really don't get along with people. They, 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 for lack of a better way of saying it, they hate others. Now, if you see light as being a reference to immoral behavior, that's fine as well. Um, but I'm going to be seeing a light and darkness as being love and hatred to one another, because later on he'll make those distinctions. Um, the other, um, uh, another aspect of these two groups is that people make it a habit to live um, uh, um, uh, in perpetual sin. Uh, that um, uh, they don't, they have no need, uh, they have no need to confess uh, their sin because. Um, uh, once saved, they don't, they don't need to do it. But the other group of people recognize they are sinners and they do confess and their relationship is um, in good standing with God. And then he moves on to uh, uh, another aspect of these two groups of people. Um, John believes that some people merely claim they have never sinned, while others know that they may sin, they may have an advocate before God, and they are forgiven sin, and, forgiven, and, and forgives. forgiveness is available for all people. Listen to what we have in 110. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So now we have this, uh, this group that are claiming this, uh, this, another potential group that's proclaiming that uh, I, I, I haven't sinned. Um, I, I've never sinned. Um, and when we make that type of claim, the author tells us that uh, we make uh, God a liar uh, because God says everyone has sinned. Um, Romans 3 talks about it, and, and Paul is just talk, uh, quoting uh, a psalm and how all people have sinned. And then he talks in, in 2.1, um, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Um, you do sin. You need to be aware that you sin, and you, may, you need to uh, take steps not to sin. Then he moves in and says, but if anyone does happen to sin, and in all probability you will, uh, John has recognized that, we have an advocate with the Father. Now this word advocate um, uh, from the word paraclete in the Greek text um, is found in John. Uh, where Jesus um, tells his disciples, um, look guys, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you uh, in a little while. And they're all, the disciples are kind of concerned about this. And uh, Jesus tries to set their mind at ease and said, look, um, you just need to know um, I, need to, I, I need to leave in order to send an advocate um, to you, a paraclete uh, to you. And so in that passage, in, in I, uh, John 14 and John 16, a uh, paraclete, uh, the advocate, is the Holy Spirit. But here in this passage, you notice Jesus is the one who's described as the paraclete. We have an advocate with the Father. Uh, we have someone uh, advocating on our behalf with God the Father. 
uh, and it's Jesus who's the Christ, and he is the righteous one. So um, we have uh, a group of people who, who think they haven't sinned and they have no need uh, to um, approach God uh, uh, at all, uh, but then there's the group of people who realizes um, that uh, we need to take steps not to sin, but in the event that we do, we do have an advocate uh, that's uh, at the right hand of the Father who makes a case for us, and he himself is the atoning sacrifice. Now, this is taking imagery of the, uh, of, uh, the temple, the tabernacle, where behind the Holy of Holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. And once a year, a high priest would go in to the um, Holy of Holies and sprinkle um, blood um, of a goat on that uh, for an atoning sacrifice on behalf of the nation. Well, first on behalf of him and his family, and then on behalf of the nation. Um, and so Jesus, uh, is presented here as um, making an atoning sacrifice uh, for the sins, our sins. But he doesn't limit it to the sins of the believers that he's writing to. He's not limiting it to those who have made a profession of faith. The author of John, the author here, John, is making it clear it isn't just for those who believe. It's for those who don't believe. It, it's for, it's for, it, he gave his blood, he, he made his, his atoning sacrifice for the entire world. Um, those who believe and those who don't believe. It's just that it's effective only for those who decide and desire to believe in the message. So we have, um, we have, um, uh, John uh, setting up scenarios concerning people groups. Uh, on the one hand, um, some who uh, who um, don't, who does not claim to live a, a light of love, versus those who do live a light of love. We have those who feel that once they've made a profession of faith, they can just continue to sin as they as they please, uh, and have no guilt of that. But then the other group who recognizes they sin, but they can go and confess their sin, and God will forgive them. And then we have this group of people who, who don't believe um, um, that they do sin, and, um, and they haven't sinned, whereas we have another group where uh, they recognize they sin, but they also recognize they have an advocate who has um, um, given his life, and makes a, a peace uh, for us with God the Father as he's in heaven. So we have this, uh, these two groups of people uh, being discussed uh, uh, in, this, in this passage. Um, and uh, uh, it began, the passage began in verse 5. We're talking about God who's perfect in love. Uh, and... Uh, and he knows the difference between the self-righteous, those who claim to believe, and the true believer who has a relationship with God. Um, he has forgiveness and um, goes before his advocate, before God. Um, so, uh, so he begins there. Who, who's in and who's out? Who has a relationship with God and who doesn't? And God knows the difference. Now, uh, John is going to move into talking about the relationship with God. And this relationship with God is demonstrated through obedience to God's command to love. And newer aspects of that obedience depicts a person's membership within God's community of true believers. So let's look at this relationship with God and um, how it is that people demonstrate um, their obedience to God's command, verses 3 through 6. Now, by this we know we have come to know God, if we keep his commandments. 
So the way we know we have a relationship with God in, in John is by keeping his commands. And the one who says, I have come to know God and yet does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in such a person. But whoever obeys his word, that is God's word, truly in his, this person, the love of God has been perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he resists in God ought himself to walk as Jesus walked. So people who demonstrate their obedience to God, um, uh, to God's command to love one another, believe, know, love other believers, know they have a relationship with God. Um, if I love my fellow believer, that's an indication that I have a relationship with God. Whereas some people claim to have a relationship with God, others demonstrate that relationship in the manner in which they, they love others. Once again, faith works. Faith in action. What I believe about God affects the way in which I live um, for God within community. And part of that involves an ability to love others. He moves in uh, verse 5. Um, this expectation to love others, um, people who obey God's expectation to love others are saved. Then um, he moves into verses seven and, seven and eight to talk about uh, the commandment of love, and that this commandment to love is not new. It's an aspect, an aspect of it is, but, um, uh, and he explains this in verses seven and eight. He says, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. And here we're right back to this idea of beginning. Beginning of what? Are we talking about uh, uh, an, eternal, uh, an eternity? Are we talking about uh, creation? Are we talking about the beginning of Jesus' ministry? I think he's talking about the beginning of uh, um, Jesus' ministry. However, it could be that he's talking about from the beginning that you accepted the gospel message, but I think, it's, I think it is a reference to Jesus and his ministry. The old commandment is the word that you have already heard. Uh, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him, that is, in Jesus and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So here in verses 7 and 8, there is this command that's not new. It's one that has uh, been around and, for a while, since the beginning of the gospel. And um, uh, the author makes it perfectly clear he's not writing a new commandment. But an aspect of the command to love is new. Um, the author acknowledges the existence of a new command and that existence of command is evidence in Jesus and new believers and true believers. Uh, we, uh, we are expected to love one another, but the, the fact that this commandment is going to believers and emphasizing the need to love and expand uh, to uh, demonstrate that love, uh, that, is a, that is a new aspect uh, in his writing here. The reader acknowledges, the author acknowledges, the existence of a new command is evidenced in Jesus and true believers. Um, and so he's, uh, and then he moves into a reasoning uh, for that. The reason and aspect of the command to love is new is because hatred is presently diminishing and love is increasing. Um, so we need to be, so the author is concerned about this. Uh, rise in hatred uh, in the community, and um, love has to increase to overcome that. Um, verse 9, uh, he uh, expands this a little bit uh, by saying, the one who says he is in the light but still hates his fellow Christian is still in the darkness. The one who loves his fellow Christian resides in the light, and there is no cause 
for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his fellow Christian is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. So he's moving into uh, talking about people who claim community membership and behave in a manner that excludes love. There's no room in the community for uh, ex the exclusion of love. Love for true believers uh, exists, and if that, you lack that love, you're not part of community. Um, he says, uh, people who exhibit love for other true believers have membership in the community and live harmoniously with others. Verse 10, the one who loves his fellow Christian resides in love, and there is no cause for stumbling. There's nothing that will trip him up. Now, this isn't always easy um, because not all people are lovable. Um, but uh, as I've said in previous uh, times and previous tapes, sometimes the loving thing to do is maybe um, to, uh, to avoid uh, a person that, um, it, that's in the body of Christ that um, you inadvertently rub the wrong way and for whatever reason um, in his presence or her presence um, it's it's uncomfortable for both of you um, so uh, perhaps you're at a church function and you're sharing a potluck dinner um, you know uh, the loving thing would do be would make be not to sit at his table or her table um, um, it, it could be a personality thing. We don't get along with everybody, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, we should strive to get along, but if, um, if someone rubs you the wrong way or you know that you rub them the wrong way for whatever reason, the loving thing might be to uh, sit with someone else and um, um, avoid a situation that might uh, be um, disruptive um, within that setting. Um, but we need to think of ways that, what are some things we do uh, that would communicate love and not hatred, uh, not to disrupt the body and cause problems. Um, the, the whole point is, uh, we don't want to do anything that would cause us to stumble. Um, I have a, I have a, um, a fella who um, just is constantly argumentative and no matter what you say, uh, you, you know, he, there could be, you could be talking about uh, how it's a beautiful day because of the sun out and there's no uh, clouds in the sky and he'll just start arguing with you about how it's not a beautiful day. Okay, I'm not really interested in arguing, you know, and I'm not going to fall into that trap and stumble and get into an unnecessary discussion about something uh, that is, you know. Uh, so the, this loving thing for me to do is just, just to avoid, arg avoid him because he's just argumentative about everything and I'm not interested in getting in arguments. And so, uh, so... Um, there's, there's no cause for be, to stumble. There's, I don't want to put myself in a place where I'm going to stumble. Um, uh, you know, another example, uh, you know, of this, uh, it could be convictions. If I know uh, I have a brother who, or a sister, who loves the King James Version, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with the King James Version. It's just not a version I like. Um, difficult to read. Um, I do think there's some, um, some decisions that are made within the King James Version uh, with regards to textual decisions that I don't agree with. I don't think it's the best translation out there. I happen to like the Net Bible. But if I know somebody really loves the King James Version, and, I mean, uh, and it's their Bible of choice, a matter of fact, a um, friend of mine in Washington Township in South Jersey, he still preaches from the King James Version. I mean, he preaches from it every Sunday, and that's fine. 
But one thing I refuse to do is to bring it up as a discussion and a point of conversation. Why would I do that? Because there's no sense arguing about it. Uh, you know, he, he loves it. I don't. We just agree to disagree, and there's no sense in trying to convince one another uh, differently. Um, that's the loving thing to do. Uh, why fight over something that you know that you just agree to disagree on? And, and, so, and, and avoid opportunities where it's going to cause you to stumble and perhaps even sin. And that's what this verse is talking about. How do we, uh, the one who loves his fellow Christians resides in love. And there's no cause for stumbling. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of examples that come to my mind are examples that have to do with convictions. Um, many times, you know, we go to church with individuals that have convictions that are different than ours. Um, and it's not to say one person's conviction um, is better than another or that another person's conviction ought to be imposed on everyone else. When I was growing up, uh, and I didn't grow up in a Christian home, uh, there would be times as a, as a kid I'd come home and I'd say, hey, uh, Dad, can I, um, can I go um, with Bobby to so-and-so, whatever it was. And my dad would tell me no, and I'd say, well, why not? He goes, well, um, it's not that there's anything wrong with what they're doing. Um, it's just not something that, that, that we value. And so um, uh, that's just uh, for us as a family. Uh, we don't value that activity. So. Um, so no, uh, I don't want you to be involved in that. But once again, there's, I'm not, we're not condemning them. We're not saying anything's wrong about that. Um, it's just not for us. Um, I think that's the mindset we should have when it comes to uh, getting along with one another and one another's convictions. Um, someone may have a, a conviction about, um, not, uh, about uh, working on Sunday and would prefer not to work on Sunday, that his conscience uh, tells him that uh, I ought not to work on Sunday. My conscience tells me that it's not a problem. I'm not going to try to change his opinion, and he ought not to try to change my opinion. It's just that we have two different um, convictions about it. Neither one is necessarily right. Neither one is necessarily wrong but their personal convictions. It's part of what a personal walk with Jesus Christ is about. Um, this, this could go to personal convictions about whether to drink a glass of wine or whether or not to have a glass of wine. Um, this could go with convictions about um, whether shoot is a bad word or whether uh, um, the other four-letter word is a bad word. I mean, the point of it is, uh, uh, Honoring one another's convictions, um, but not imposing our convictions on someone else. Um, uh, that's not loving to impose your conviction on someone else. Um, uh, and when we do that, we put ourselves in positions of stumbling, um, causing arguments, causing dissension. Um, and so uh, we, we need to think through, how do I live a life of love in community? Because there's plenty of room for hatred. There's plenty of room for hatred to, to rise its head. And so the author is here encouraging us to uh, love one another, uh, make it part of who we are to prevent us from stumbling. But the one who hates his fellow Christians, the one, and I think, you know, to pick fights, to, um, uh, to, um, intentionally peeve someone off, these are, signs of, of, these are signs of hatred. These are not signs that are becoming of a, a loving Christian. Uh, they're in darkness and walk in darkness and does not know where he's going um, because we're blinded. 
And I think it's a heart condition. Um, if we just like stirring up the mud, we just like to be confrontational, um, that's, a life of, that's a life of darkness. That's not becoming uh, of a, a believer who lives a life of love and looks for ways to, to live um, accepting of others if you're always contentious and stirring up the muck. So anyway, so John is concerned about relationships. He's concerned about um, relationships that um, uh, uh, put us in good standing with God and others in the community. Um, God is well aware of those who have a, a good standing with him based upon how uh, they live. And of course, uh, here we're talking about um, uh, the need to keep in God's command, which has to do with loving one another. Okay, till next time, we will, uh, we will uh, deal with uh, words of assurance uh, beginning in chapter 2, verse 12. In the meantime, have a great day and be loving. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 27, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 11. Relationships with God and others.